for seaweed. Thank you, Gerandi. Um, and welcome to our May cost growth target uh, tag meeting. Um, reminder, I think folks here are pretty good about this, but as you enter the Zoom meeting, if you can um, edit your name, uh, title, um, text to reflect what organization you're from. Um, it helps us with replying to people in the chat uh, and also uh, attendance later. All right, I think those are, that should do it. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, here's the agenda for today. So we'll have the same update summary of last month. Um, but the bulk of our conversation today, we want to focus on an overview um, of the accountability methodology we have thus far and get some feedback from uh, folks. This is also a topic we're going to carry over to the June tag meeting as well. Next slide, please. All right, so last month in the April tag meeting, the meeting summary notes are posted online. We discussed uh, the draft of the 2023 data submission materials. Uh, there were no substantial changes, um, just a couple clarification edits to the submission manual and the facts. Uh, the template itself was updated to reflect the measurement years we're collecting this September. Um, but other than that, there was no um, substantial change. Uh, also last month, we entertained the idea of what it would look like if we could break out medical pharmacy spending thanks to all of those that uh, gave us really good feedback. Um, we discussed the feasibility of this change. It's, of course, a lot more complicated once you get down into the nitty gritty of how um, this is documented in claims data. Um, so this is something we're still thinking about. Um, folks raised the possibility of maybe piloting this kind of reporting with a small group of interested payers. So we haven't moved on that exactly, but um, that's going to be in the back of our minds um, as we go forward, but no, no change to the 2023 submission um, at all on this topic. Next slide. All right. Um, we have some program updates, and for this, I'm going to hand this off to Margaret. Margaret, go ahead. Thanks, Trang. Can you hear me okay? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so program updates. Um, next slide, please. Um, the first update is just a reminder that we published our first two reports using the CGT data that we collected from you all earlier this month. Um, the first report was published on May 2nd with uh, spending from 2018 to 2020, just at the state and market level. And then a week later, we released the 2020 to 2021 spending report, um, which included state market payer and provider organization level. Um, so I'm sure all of you were aware of that, but if you haven't had a chance to look at the reports yet, they're up on our website. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then on the heels of those reports being released, we had the first part of the public hearing for this year to present the results in the reports and have some discussion. So that happened a week ago on May 17th. Um, if you missed that one, the recording of the hearing along with the hearing materials are also up on our website at the link below. Next slide, please. Um, and just as a reminder, that was only the first part of the public hearings for this year. Uh, the advisory committee decided to split the public hearing into two. 
So uh, the second iteration of the public hearing on 2020 to 21 cost growth trends um, is going to happen in September on the 14th. Um, any questions on any of those updates? Great. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the 2023 legislative session update. Um, just as a reminder, we're only providing this update for informational purposes. OHA does not have a position on any of the bills um, and is not asking the group to take a position on any of this. Um, uh, as presented last time, we just have one bill remaining in the legislative session that's related to the cost growth target program, and that is House Bill 2045. Um, which is formerly uh, 2742. Um, and the content of that bill is to exclude workforce costs from consideration as total health care expenditures. So basically exempt any um, growth due to workforce costs from accountability in the program. Um, and that bill, since we last met, um, passed on the House floor um, and is now in the Senate. Next slide, please. That's all of the program updates also. Thanks. All right. Um, and I think all the payer technical contacts should know this, but um, the final 2023 data submission materials have been posted online and emailed out to you all. Uh, next slide. So if you go on our data submission webpage, it's linked there. Um, there are three updated files, the data submission template, none of the layouts or fields are changed. Um, it's just the dates, the measurement years are changed. So this September, we're collecting spending for services uh, in year 2021 and 2022. Um, the manual has been updated, so has the facts. Uh, we are leaving our 2022 data submitter training recording up because there are no substantial changes to the submission methodology. Um, we're going to leave that up for this year. So if you want a refresher on how, um, like an overview of the template, or if you have new staff coming on board that need an orientation, um, please refer them to this uh, training webinar. You'll see the slide deck is posted. There's also a cost growth target template with mock data um, linked as well. Um, files this year are due first Friday in September. So that's September 1st for medical expenses uh, incurred by Oregon residents for, as I said before, years 2021 and 2022. Um, any questions before we go on? And as in previous years, uh, if folks have questions, you know where to find us, just email our program inbox. It's manned by multiple people and our team will get back to you with any questions. Okay, so let's jump right on in to the uh, accountability methodology. We're going to talk about the uh, performance improvement plans, um, which we have spoken about a little bit before in this venue. Um, and then we'll talk about what we are proposing for financial penalties. And um, yeah, open to feedback from everybody here. Next slide. So to start off, here is a quick snapshot of the pipeline from data collection to validation to accountability. Um, I won't go through each box, but you can see we're operating on an annual cycle of collecting data files, validating that data with payers um, and provider organizations. Um, both of those groups, those entities, will have one-on-one -on -one meetings with our team um, where we'll talk about trends, 
and uh, reasons behind uh, trends, cost drivers. We've done this two times now. Um, and in those meetings, we haven't really had to dig down and investigate. We don't ask for supplemental materials or anything like that, but all of those conversations are in preparation for when we are in an accountability year. Um, so hopefully this long runway this program has been operating on has uh, helped everybody kind of get used to that flow. So we're going to talk about accountability, determination, um, and PIPs and financial penalties, but also so folks know um, something that always happens in tandem with all of that is the annual public reporting and annual hearing. Um, but let's let's go on to the next slide and talk about those accountability methodologies. So when we're talking about accountability in the program, um, you all know we, uh, have statistical confidence uh, built into our trend assessment. Um, that's to give us an idea of the likelihood that these trends are truly above the state um, cost growth target. If you've looked at our public hearing or um, the 2020 to 2021 report, um, you'll see those confidence interval bars. Some are very big, some are very small. Um, that's just the way uh, the spending per person looks for an entity. And if that uh, confidence interval bar overlaps with the 3.4%, then we say it's indeterminate. Um, and that's kind of, we've been calling them off ramps. Um, on the accountability path. So that's one big part of accountability in Oregon. Um, another big component is transparency. So that looks like, uh, well, first of all, it looks like the one-on-one -on -one conversations we have with you, um, which are confidential, but it is, uh, you know, collaboration, transparency between payers and provider organizations and OHA. Um, a public facing part of it are going to be the public reports and public hearings, uh, which we are doing this year. We've had our first public hearing uh, just this month and the second one, as Margaret said, is happening in September. So beyond that, uh, we also have the next two components, performance improvement plans and then further escalating accountability. Uh, performance improvement plans, keep in mind, these are not automatically, they're not automatically applied to entities, but given the trend, the confidence intervals, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, which will include justifiable reasons and documentation for justifiable reasons, um, those factor into whether or not we, we go into performance improvement plans. And then there are other factors that are considered before going into financial penalties. Um, so just wanted to mention those before we moved further. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, oh, I think I already covered this big part of understanding uh, performance are those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So um, I think I've already mentioned all of these uh, things previously, but we really depend on your team to come to those meetings um, ready to talk about trends. One thing we say a lot in those meetings is, you know, these cost growth level trends we look at, it's, those are, real dollars and that's what the per person trend looks like, but it, it's not, you know, we don't really ever see the reasons behind it. We uh, come into those data validation meetings with uh, an agenda, which you've seen, and you'll see we specifically prompt you with a lot of questions um, that strike our curiosity and maybe we wanna dig into that. 
as we move forward, um, especially to an accountability year, which is delayed, so not this year, but for data submitted in 2024, um, the year we talk about that data in that data cycle, we'll um, be asking a lot more pointed questions and uh, needing to follow up with folks on supplying some kind of documentation. Some of which some of you have already uh, shown us, been willing to show us, which we really appreciate. So I think that um, puts folks in a really good position for 2024, if you're, you and your team get into the habit of that. Um, any questions as I move forward? This is still in the overview phase of accountability. All right, let's go to the next slide then. So we're doing these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, we are going to be talking about factors driving cost growth um, and determining whether they seem to be reasonable or not. This is a list uh, many people have seen before. Um, in the design of this program, the implementation committee um, really considered a lot of good reasons for being over the cost growth target. One thing we say often is that not all cost growth is bad. Um, and also not all cost growth is within the control of, of one singular entity. You could see the categories we have up here. There could be changes in mandated benefits. We've actually spoken to a lot of you on some of these factors in our data validation meetings. Um, new treatments, um, a category called acts of God, which include things like pandemics and natural uh, disasters. Um, we did add, the program has added macroeconomic factors, um, especially given the increase in uh, just general inflation um, in the economy right now. So macroeconomic factors is added there. Um, there is also a new box for in light blue uh, for frontline worker compensation. So this is, um, kind of a tentative category, um, depending on how that bill moves through this legislative session. Any questions? Chang, we've got a question in the chat. Okay, let me see. Hi, Travis, okay. So, sorry, I'm just going to read this out loud. So during this process last year, um, Travis ended up creating a mock-up of a template to prepare for the conversations. It did help him focus on the areas OHA wanted to focus on. Would it be possible to provide us a template where we could drop in our current and last year data ahead of time? Um, so the templates, are you taught, Travis, are you talking about the data output? Um, I'm talking about the, um, you have a template that you use to analyze the current year versus the previous year that also looks at uh, year over year growth and looks at the, and does the calculations for a percentage of growth, but also looked at what our current, like for this situation, what our 2021 submittal looked like last year versus what our 2021 submittal would look like this year and also looked at any changes in um, in how those went. It's part of the follow-up process, the analysis you do before you come to us and have that conversation after submittal. But when I went through that practice, it helped me to identify any areas um, for additional uh, focus, which uh, in one case, it actually helped me correct a uh, programming error on my side before submittal. Oh, that's great. I I think I know what you're referring to. And that was because- I think, 
Yeah. Sorry, Travis, you're talking about the data output. Um, so are you asking if we could provide a mock-up or an, a data output in advance of when we normally would in our in our process? Um, not so much that, uh, as much as uh, providing that feedback that has to come from you, so much as if you could provide us the Excel tool that produces that output. Got it. Okay. I think we might need to talk about that internally, but we will report back. Terrific. Thank you. Good question. Any others? Let's go to the next slide. So here's a timeline. This is taken out of that uh, accountability update um, PDF announcement that was released in March. Um, so the uh, advisory committee, which is uh, our governance committee for this program, decided to uh, hold delay accountability for one extra year given the um, state of the economy and labor markets, workforce, inflation uh, trends happening right now. So this is the same timeline from that update. Just wanted to throw this up for folks again today um, to show that data submitted this September, September 2023, um, PIPs will not apply to any data um, in this upcoming data cycle. So we'll get more practice in these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, hopefully by now, a lot of you will be getting to see your data output for a third time now. So um, the repeated uh, viewing of, of cost growth target data, uh, hopefully, it not being the first time, not even being the second time, um, uh, you could start to gain a lot more insight and um, yeah, have some really good one-on-one -on -one data validation meetings. Uh, if you look at the next column, uh, cost growth between 2022 and 2023, um, that data is going to be submitted September of 2024. Um, so that is going to be the cycle where PIPs will apply. Uh, and I think that's all I want to say about this slide. Next slide, please. Hey, Frank, can yeah. I can I soften that last sentence you just said? Sure. Um, like, sure. It's the first time in which a PIP could potentially apply to a payer or provider who exceeds the cost growth target with statistical certainty and without a good reason. So I, I just want to be really clear. It's the first time it could happen. That does not mean that it's an automatic, everyone who exceeds the cost growth target automatically gets a PIP. Yes. Yeah, those last two rows in that table, PIPs and financial penalties, those are not automatic activities for everybody. <laughs> and some of you are probably sick of hearing us say that, but I think it's really important to be technically accurate about when things apply and where and be really clear about what things are automatic and what things are not and will require a lot of that discussion and processing and understanding the reasons as Trang described. Mm -hmm. Yes, very important points. Let's go to the next slide, which is a, oh, wait, one before. I guess we were already on it. Okay, here we go. So um, although PIPs do not exist uh, this year, um, we are still planning on going through the rulemaking process. Um, to, to solidify the PIP process, the template um, later this year. So this is this rulemaking timeline on the right slide of this, the right side of this slide is a overview snapshot. This is also taken from the March 2023 accountability update. Um, we want to uh, talk about uh, these methodologies with folks today excuse me, again, next uh, month in that TAG meeting um, to collect feedback. 
Uh, we will be discussing this with the advisory committee. The plan later on in the year, July, August, is to start recruitment for the Rules Advisory Committee um, and hold that actual meeting in September. So that is the plan. Um, and as before today, we're asking for your feedback. Your feedback will inform uh, our draft rule language um, and any materials brought to the rack. And I wanna also clarify, I know when we did the data submission rulemaking, we repurposed the tag meeting as the RAC and you are all the RAC members. That's not what we're going to do for accountability. We will have a separately sort of seated and appointed RAC and tag members, tag participants are certainly going to be welcome to apply to that, um, but it will be separate and outside of the tag meetings. Yes. And action and recruitment for racks moving forward, it's going to be its own kind of process, right, Sarah, the way we're doing racks now? Yeah, so there will be a rack recruitment or essentially a call if you would like to be part of the rack. And while this isn't final yet, I think we're planning on having this be a fairly large rack. So it'll be anyone who wants to be part of the rack, probably. It won't be, you know, there's only two seats it'll be it'll be more broad than that um but i think we will likely look at a limitation like only one representative from each organization could be on the rack so we're you know not five people from the same plan on the rack but every plan that wants to be on the rack could be on the rack so we'll have more details when we launch the recruitment and we'll certainly send a notice about all of this out to the tag distribution list. But just wanted to clarify that it's not going to be sort of in the tag meeting automatic, you all are RAC members like we've done for the data submission. Yeah. Are there any questions about the timing or why we're doing rulemaking, why we're planning on doing rulemaking this year, anything like that before we get into the details? One question that I got yesterday that might be helpful for folks is, are there certain types of people that we're looking for on the rack? I mean, we will provide more detail on that, but I don't think so. It's not specific expertise or you know specific. It's you're someone who can represent your organization and you're familiar and going to be ready to sh share feedback and talk about the process. So for some of you, that might be your government relations folks. For some of you, that might be you. Um, it might be your advisory committee member if that's the level of leadership that's engaging with our program. So we really expect that will be a mix based on who you are and how you've been connecting with the program, but it's it's really up to you. We're not going to say that you have to be a tag participant to be on the rack or that you have to be a data analyst to be on the rack or anything like that. I'm not seeing any questions or seeing any hands and you all know that makes me nervous. So you sure no questions at this point? Okay. Well, let's get into PIPs then. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna cover the next couple slides. Um, if these look a little familiar to you, uh, it's probably because we shared these last year, April or May <laughs> tag last year. And we did get a little bit of feedback, which you'll see in these slides. Um, but uh, we want to get this in front of folks now, um, now with another year of uh, data submission under our belts and rulemaking uh, planned for the summer fall um, of this year. All right, next, next slide. Okay. So once again, performance improvement plans, they are a part of um, accountability in the program, but it is not an automatic activity for folks. Um, 
the we look at statistical certainty, we look at the reasonable basis for cost drivers um, for uh, an entity's performance uh, year trend um, in any of the three markets we cover, Medicaid, Medicare, that's Medicare Advantage, and commercial. Next slide. All right, so um, the guidance, uh, the program received from the implementation committee uh, helps design what the PIP process looks like. So at a high level, OHA is committed to working with uh, payers and provider organizations uh, in a collaborative manner to develop the PIPs. Um, we could talk a little bit about that and what that looks like in uh, the next few slides. So our team is available here to provide uh, technical assistance. Um, PIPs will be multi-year to allow for time to improve. I think when we spoke about this last year, folks mentioned um, we might need to uh, extend reporting beyond the end of a PIP implementation period just to allow um, some run out time to see those improvements. Um, so you'll see that reflected in these slides. Um, it's actually related to the third bullet, um, uh, those PIP progress reports. Um, we'll have periodic PIP progress reports as a part of this uh, activity. Um, and PIPs and progress reports will be publicly available. Um, they will be posted to our webpage in a separate accountability section. Um, just to note, during the PIP process or you know, supplying supplemental documentation, um, there could be documentation that is deemed confidential. And of course, we won't um, publicly post any, any of that, but the PIPs and progress reports themselves um, will be publicly posted. All right, let's go to the next slide. So once OHA determines a PIP is required, um, an entity has 90 calendar days to develop and submit their proposed PIP. We will have a template for folks to fill out. Um, OHA is also committed to publishing uh, guidance materials and some examples to help staff uh, put it together. Um, we'll also offer technical assistance. So that could look like uh, written guidance, um, maybe a webinar walking through the template, the timeline. Um, we could also do an early review and give feedback on a PIP draft prior to submission. Um, and at the end, once the, the PIP is submitted, um, we'll review and assess based on some published criteria the program has and either one, approve the PIP um, or to require the entity to resubmit with changes. Um, and there will be, uh, I forget the amount of time, but there's different timelines uh, for, for different things. So if we do require a resubmission um, course, your, your team will get more time and, and we could accommodate that in the timeline. Um, I see some questions in the chats. Um, publishing, yeah, might lead people to be less candid and more face-saving. Um, and I see Sarah replied. I'm gonna switch one. Yeah, so, I think I could say, so the, the PIPs themselves are not super granular. The template we are working on and that will share out ahead of the June tag meeting, you'll see a lot of it is going to be um, 
a little more high level. There's a lot of narrative. We're not asking for um, detailed uh, data, you know, projections or anything like that. Um, there could, yeah, Sarah. Yeah, I'm actually, I'd love to hear feedback from others um, on Travis's comment because when we look at Massachusetts, our leader state with the cost growth target program, um, Massachusetts recently put their first organization on a PIP. So um, their program structured a little bit differently. Um, it took them, you know, 10 years before they put an organization on a PIP and that PIP is public. But what we've learned from Massachusetts is that you know, in all of those years leading up to that, they had a lot of behind the scenes conversations, a lot of information sharing, a lot of discussion, and none of that was publicly disclosed. So I'm interested in what people think, like, no, now that you've been through a couple rounds of the conversations with our team, um, knowing the kinds of questions we're asking, what level of detail around PIPs are of interest? I think we have a commitment to transparency and I really, you know, there's a, at minimum, organizations that are on a PIP, we would need to make that public. But I'm wondering, is there, like, what, what, do, what do people think? Like, do people share Travis's concerns? This is Kristen. I'll say it probably depends on the issue. Um, some things that they're proprietary or have to do with different business agreements and those kind of things, we'd probably just want to make sure in the rules we detail what kind of consideration would be given before we did make something public to um, Rep. Nelson's point. Thanks, Greg. Looks like you also share concerns. I'm wondering if this is something we can think about more because I think we do want to make information transparent, but maybe with some confidentiality protections if there's business sensitive information. Would that might, how might that work as a sort of splitting the difference? Where there might be information that's disclosed to OHA, but not made public. Yeah, and that this is Greg from Kaiser. I think that what we need to do is you look at what is proprietary and there could be some information that would be shareable that could be proprietary, but I would be looking to OHA to have a process where we can say, okay, there's a certain level of high level stuff that is going to be public and you know it's gonna be public. But if there's a separate set of things that say due to proprietary, this would not be expected to be shared where you clearly delineate something where we can sit there and hold that. That'll encourage a lot more transparency between OHA and the, say the carriers. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think um, we don't want to create any reasons for you to start being less transparent with us. Um, and so I think maybe we can take that back and think about ways where there might be some delineation between what's shared um, or what's reported for a PIP versus what's then made publicly um, published, shareable. And I think if folks have additional thoughts about what some of those, if you have you know, hypothetical examples. Um, I think, Kristen, the point about like a contract, that's helpful. If there are other things that you think might be similarly sensitive or proprietary, that might be helpful for us to think about. Larry, I see your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would just call out too, I think we've learned some of this from the CCOs around even just a matter of public posting, but also what about public records requests? If we're submitting a PIP to you all for review, what comes available for public records request? And do we need to ensure that appropriate redactions are done upon such a request? That's a great call. And I think something for us to think about in rulemaking is um, if there are um, protections around public records requests. And that's something we've dealt with in other programs. So I think we can look to that for some examples. And um, I think my team is going to share the link in the chat, but for folks who haven't seen it, um, you might want to take a look at the Massachusetts PIP and see what level of detail they made public. Um, and, you know, I'd love feedback on, like, is that the right amount of detail? Do you have concerns about the level of detail that was made public in Massachusetts? Um, sort of helping pinpoint that a little bit would, would be helpful.
Thanks, Trey. Other feedback, thoughts about the confidentiality or public transparency -ness on this? Mm, Philip, can you say more? Sure. Um, I think just what comes to mind is that, you know, if, if people are starting to experience PIPs, it's, and it's not necessarily, you know, um, directly related to performance, and it's more of like shifts in the market or changes in policy or whatever it may be, um, you know, I would, I would want to know if others are experiencing challenges and there's ways to inform us about that so that we can accommodate um, and learn from what challenges other are experiencing in, in the market. That's um, specifics are not as important as much as actionable items. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to ask, let me throw this back to you. Um, in our report that we just published um, with the payer and provider level data for 2020 and 2021, we summarized at a fairly high level the themes about the challenges that we heard from payers and providers. Um, if you haven't seen that, I'm wondering if is that what you're getting at or would you be looking for more specifics like which of these themes for which of the entities um, were a driver or a concern? Um, yeah, I think it reinforces the level of reporting you guys have been providing. Um, it's been helpful to see that in, in from a clinical perspective. Okay, that's helpful. Other thoughts, Trang, I'm sorry, I took over facilitation, but I'm. this is a really interesting sort of direction for feedback and I'm interested in making sure we really hear from folks here. Okay, I don't see anything else. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is really helpful. Thanks, everybody. So um, PIP process implementation and reporting. So once a PIP um, does get approved and it begins, uh, periodic progress reports are due to OHA, these progress reports. We, last year, we originally set them at quarterly, but got a lot of feedback from folks that might, it might make more sense to have this uh, on a six month basis, uh, just to be able to collect enough data to report a trend, um, which sounds really fair to us. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, PIPs and progress reports um, will be published to OHA's website. Um, yes, confidential information will not be included. So yeah, we will wanna um, have some separation of, of information supplied to us and then with what information gets uh, further posted publicly to the website for public transparency in the program. Um, any questions? Yes, Greg, six months may be reasonable, but realize it could take longer for impact to show up in the data. Yeah, we, last year I was looking at the notes, we talked about um, looking at performance even after the PIP activity uh, period had ended. I don't think we have a, oh, we'll only look, you know, one year post to end of a PIP. We don't um, have anything like that. That might be something we need to take on a case by case. Uh, and I think I want to clarify, because Greg, this is an important point. Like, I think you'll see in the next couple of slides when we talk about some of the PIP content, I think the kinds of things we're envisioning that are in PIPs and the kinds of things that would be included in those progress reports, we would hope that some of those are things where we might see more immediate um, impact. So they might be much more process measures and not the total cost of care measurement. Um, absolutely would expect that to take longer and that's on its own reporting. So I think we're looking at creating some, that, that PIPs would involve creating intermediary process measures where we would be able to tell if things are changing. So I'm just going to throw out a bunch of examples that may or may not be relevant, but 
if, for example, maybe one cost driver that was identified or something that what an organization was working on in a PIP was related to contracting. And they said in our PIP, what part of what we're going to do is move more of our contracts to these specific types of value-based payment arrangements or um, move more to a global budget, something like that. Um, maybe then what's being reported in the PIP is, you know, what percent of contracts have been renewed and have moved into that new VBP model. Um, so much more process focused um, where I would hope we would be able to see impact, even if we're not seeing the effect on the total cost of care until a longer timeline. Does that make sense? And I think we're going to share a little bit more on the next couple of slides. All right, uh, let's let's get to it. Um, so uh, part of the PIP um, build out uh, is identifying and addressing those root causes that uh, may have led an entity to exceed the cost growth target. Um, you could have one, multiple. I think we'll the next slide we'll talk a little bit more about root causes, but um, that's going to be the focus of the PIP. What are what are we trying to hone in on? Um, overall, they uh, the PIPs must be implemented, designed to be implemented within 24 months. Uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, so. These are sections um, for each identified root cause, what the, the PIP is asking folks to address. Um, strategies, um, key activities to implement the strategy. Uh, we're going to talk about outcome measures and balancing measures, um, and particularly balancing measures to uh, ensure that we avoid any negative impacts. Um, as those measures get implemented throughout the PIP implementation period, um, we do want folks to plan for and track uh, the need to adjust the strategy over time if, if uh, data, if trends are going in a direction um, that is not optimal. Uh, and as Sarah was saying, this is, we got some feedback based on the TAG meeting last year about what kind of uh, measures should be in the PIP. Um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, so these measures could totally be process focused um, and not necessarily something you have to wait uh, for, um, claims run out or something like that at a for a um, more granular level of interaction. I know looking at these uh, categories, they could feel really big. Um, I think if people have thoughts on this content now, that would be great. Um, I think we are going to talk about the template once you see what the template looks like um, and the level of granularity uh, the PIP is asking for. Um, you'll see it's fairly flexible. Okay. So the next slide is basically a prompt slide for questions. So let's go to that. So we uh, talked about the timeline to submit a PIP, some ideas for technical assistance from OHA um, to entities that uh, may be undertaking a PIP. Um, we talked about progress reporting and a high level look at the PIP template contents. Um, Right now, are there any uh, thoughts from the TAG group on, on this proposed process and template? <laughs> and know that we are, we are gonna carry over this conversation to next month too. All right. Okay, I think, 
maybe I, for next month too, if we could get some um, more uh, information on, you know, what's publicly posted, what's uh, acceptable to OHA, but we'll consider it, um, you know, in the confidential bucket of information, um, that would be helpful. And I'm going to second the call for you know, really encouraging folks to take a look at what Massachusetts did for their for their PIP and try and link to that. And I'm really curious about about thoughts. And you know, if, if your organization was asked to do something similar, um, what are the pros and cons of that approach? Um, we're definitely learning a lot from Massachusetts, and want to think about if if they have any great examples or um, how you feel about that. So please please feel free to send us comments and reactions to that as well. Okay. Well, I can see Zachary has come into the virtual Zoom room and we are now at financial penalties. So walk us through those, Zachary. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, can do. Thanks, Drang. Uh, so hi everyone, Zachary Goldman on the OIG team. Let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna be talking about financial penalties, how they're calculated, we're going to go through some examples, uh, and then I want to open it up for some uh, for some input. So just to ground us on uh, the statute, um, here's I'm not going to read this text, but uh, but here it is. Um, here's the uh, the statute that grants us uh, authority to uh, impose penalties, as well as kind of what factors uh, must be considered uh, when devising the size of the penalty. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, so we considered um, uh, a few different, uh, four different approaches for how to calculate the penalty. And we have a recommendation. Um, what I'm gonna do is walk you all through the recommended approach. And then I'm gonna share the three kind of alternative scenarios, um, different ways to calculate um, the penalty. And then I, we have kind of a matrix to show which ones kind of check off the statutory requirements and which don't. And there's some pretty clear, uh, some pretty clear differences there. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the proposed size of the penalty here is based on three different uh, inputs, if you will. One is how far over the target um, the entity's cost grew. Uh, so if it's a 10% growth in PMPM and how far over that target of 3.4%, the second input is the, the dollar amount, so the per member per month cost. Uh, and the third is the size of the market we're talking about for that entity, um, number of member months. Um, this is a kind of a direct quote uh, from uh, the bill, from the statute, the cr criteria must be based on the size of, of the entity. So we feel like the number of member months is a pretty good representation of the size um, for, for the issue that we're trying to deal with here. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the proposal here is that we use the overage, which is to say kind of the actual uh, PMPM in year two, minus what that year two PMPM would have been had it grown at 3.4%. Uh, so that overage, uh, as well as the entity's per member per month cost, that, that PMPM allows us to convert that overage into a dollar amount. And then we use the number of member months to kind of scale it up, if you will, uh, depending on the size of the entity. I think this will be a lot more clear once we go through an actual example. Also of note, when I say year two, I don't mean year two of the program, I just mean year two of the two year performance period that we're assessing. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then we've kind of built in some escalating accountability here. So uh, the proposal is here that the first instance of an entity's penalty will be 110% of the overage. Again, you'll, you'll see what we mean by overage in a few minutes. But for subsequent kind of infractions, if you will, uh, the second and third instances of the penalty, the size of the penalty will be 130%, uh, 150% respectively. So there's kind of this, this growing penalty size um, if there's you know, repeat offenders, if you will, um, of, uh, of going over the cost growth with statistical certainty, uh, without a reasonable justification, right? All the, all the caveats that we talked about before. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
let's jump into an example. I think this will help kind of flesh out what we're really talking about and ground us in, in what we really mean. Okay, so here's some made up number, uh, made up entity. Uh, this is, uh, let's call it entity A, their annual per member per month cost uh, and the growth in one market. So let's say this is commercial. Uh, so in year one, let's call it year one, TMPM was $450. It grew up to four hundred seventy-seven dollars. That's a growth of six percent. Year three, the PMPM four ninety-three. That's a growth of three point three percent, et cetera, et cetera. So, in the five performance periods, um, by which I mean the the percentages here. So, in the five two-year performance periods, this entity exceeded the cost growth four times. So every every time except for the uh, between year two and three, uh, when they grew at three point three percent. But every other time, they grew higher than three four. Uh, notably, this is also let's let's call this an adjusted PMPM uh, for a single market, right? So we're using that um, that uh, age sex adjustment that um, that you all are familiar with. Let's go to the next slide. So here we have a matrix, and again, this is an example. But let's say uh, from year one to year two, when they grew at six percent, that uh, they exceeded the target, but it was due to a reasonable factor. Um, so no penalty. Right. Yes, they're over three, four, but that's reasonable. It was explained away. It was justified because of um, whatever, whatever the situation was, it was acceptable as a reasonable factor. Uh, between year two and three, growth did not exceed the target. So no accountability there. That's fine. Uh, no penalty there. Uh, but then in the latter three performance periods, they both exceeded the target with statistical confidence and there's no reasonable factor uh, was applicable. Um, and in this example, let's say this is the entity's first financial penalty. So we're not dealing with a second infraction or a third. This is just their first one. Let's go to the next one. So here's where we get a little um, little mathy, but um, it'll be fun. So step one, so we have to calculate the penalty for the, the single, uh, let's start with the first two year performance period that they went over the target without a reasonable factor. So the question is how far over 3.4% um, did the entity's actual PMPM grow? So from three to four, uh, the PMPM grew from 493 to 512. That's a 4% growth. Had the PMPM grown at 3.4%, that PMPM in year four would have been four, uh, 509. The difference between 512 and 509 is, is $3. These are rounded to the dollar um, to make it clean. So that's step one. So we've calculated the overage there and we've monetized it by applying the PMPM. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now for step two, we need to kind of scale it accordingly based on the size of that entity's line of business or the market. So in year four, the entity had 70,000 member months um, in that line of business. Let's go to the next slide. We combine steps one and two together by multiplying them. So that roughly $3 times 70,000 members times 1.1, because again, uh, the penalty is 110% of the overage. That results in a total dollar amount for this single two-year performance period of 227,646. Let's go to the next slide. So that's kind of phase one of calculating the penalty, but we need to repeat those steps for every two-year performance period that exceeds the target with confidence and without a reasonable factor. So when you go through those same steps, um, calculating the overage, monetizing it with the PMPM, scaling it up to the uh, uh, how many member months you have, we get um, four, from years four to five, that's 440, uh, sorry, $434,046 for the last performance period, 164,093, <clears throat> excuse me, 937. <clears throat> excuse me, and then so the total penalty for the three years that exceeded the target are uh, just over uh, $800,000. Let's go to the next line. So that's the, that's the proposal on the table, but let's kind of flesh out some alternatives that we've, we've considered. Um, and we tried to square that up with the statutory requirements of the program. So one alternative is to base the penalty, not on overage of how far over the cost growth you went, but on just the percent of the entity's total revenue. Um, 
this makes it really simple for a calculation uh, and it makes it really predictable. You know, let's say it's 0.1% of total revenue or 1% of total revenue. Um, clean, clean, very predictable, uh, but doesn't reflect the degree to which the entity exceeded the target, which is clearly in statute. So that's, that's the downside. Um, this has no bearing on if the entity was at 20% year over year growth or, you know, 3.5% uh, year over year growth. So uh, it kind of fails on that merit. Let's go to the next one though, because we have another alternative. And this is calculating it completely on a case by case basis. So this allows for maximum flexibility, right? Um, between the agency, OHA, and, and, and the entity, uh, we could figure out exactly what that should be. The downside though, is this is completely unpredictable uh, for the entities uh, and highly subjective to be frank. So uh, had we not included any type of, you know, actual calculation or methodology and just said, well, we'll just kind of figure it out on a case by case basis, um, that, that leaves the door open maybe a little too wide for uh, a lot of subjectivity to be introduced. And let's go to the third one and then I'm gonna pause for a minute. So let's go to the next slide. So this third one is a little more complicated or maybe a lot more complicated. Uh, we could think of something like a points-based rubric to calculate a penalty. Um, so you could divide penalty amounts into maybe different tiers, uh, maybe assign different points based on multiple factors, uh, similar to maybe how like a, a complicated procurement looks like for you know, a request for proposal. Uh, you get you know, a dozen uh, submissions you score each section from zero to 10 and whoever gets the, you know, so it, it could be something like that. Um, this would be highly structured. It'd be very kind of rigorous, which, uh, which factor is, um, you know, has the most weight and, and how you figure that out. Uh, but this is pretty complicated. Um, and also potentially some subjectivity here too, uh, as you, as you have to assign some kind of value to, um, to, to some some factor like you know the size of the entity or how far over so it's you know the cut points could be uh, could vary and that introduces some subjectivity. Let's go to the next slide. So let's kind of put these all together here and then um, uh, after this I'm going to open it up. Uh, so we have the we have at the at the top x axis here kind of the, the, some of the goals that are clearly spelled out either in statute or are just good, you know, public policy, right? Predictability for entities. We feel like that's, that's a valuable thing. Um, quote, based on the degree to which the provider or payer exceeded the target, that's straight from the statute. So we have to do that. Uh, another one based on the size of the provider or payer organization, that's in statute. We have to do that. Um, administratively simple. That's, that's just a good, you know, we're, we're hoping to find a good simple solution that works for everything. So we added that as one kind of criteria as we weigh these different proposals. The proposal on the table, that checks off all four. Basing it on revenue, that only checks off a couple. Um, uh, administratively simple, we do have the revenue uh, for some entities, but not all. So we need to either collect data about revenue from some entities or, or otherwise get that information. So that gets a little more complicated. Case by case basis, again, checks off a couple, but isn't predictable. Definitely isn't administratively simple. Similarly with some kind of points-based rubric, um, checks off a couple, but isn't predictable, isn't simple at all. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, let me finish up with some kind of guardrails um, to the penalty size. Uh, talk a little bit about um, a quick kind of flow chart of what, what this would look like and, and how this would all fit together between um, PIPs and, and the penalty. And then, and then I wanna open it up because I'm sure folks have some thoughts. So some guardrails um, to the penalty size. So one thing, and it's in statute, we must consider overlapping penalties that may be imposed for failing to meet the target, such as requirements related to um, MLR. Uh, so that's, that's something that we have to incorporate here. Secondly, um, OAJ, we'd work with DCBS to ensure that any financial penalty does not create a separate regulatory issue related to solvency. This didn't come out of statute, but it did come out of the implementation uh, committee report. So we definitely want to fold that in as well as kind of potentially some, some limiting factors to the penalty size and times in which the penalty might be reduced. 
Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here's a really high level kind of flow chart of these different accountability processes. So let's let's talk about um, let's talk about this top one, which is really focusing on the PIP, the performance improvement plan. So OHA, we calculate the cost growth, we do the statistical testing. If, and I'm going up top here, if growth meets the target or is indeterminate based on those confidence intervals, then there's no accountability. But if the growth exceeds the target with confidence, then there's kind of a second tier <clears throat> of questioning. Is growth reasonable? If so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, if so, it, then it, it kind of meets the things that, that we've talked about thus far, then there's no accountability. But if growth is unreasonable, doesn't align with those uh, previously established uh, reasonable factors, then, uh, then there's a performance improvement plan. Let's drop down here. The penalties are really kind of a wider view, which is to say the growth exceeds the target in at least three out of five uh, performance years, uh, performance periods, uh, without acceptable reason. So in that's, if that's the case, OHA calculates the financial penalty. Uh, we check for insolvency concerns. We check for any overlapping uh, with any other penalties. Uh, and then uh, and then there's the financial penalty. Let's move on to the next slide, which I think is just the open tag feedback slide. And so here's where I wanna open it up, um, get some thoughts, get some reactions. I see one question in the chat here from Bill. What if an entity has alternating years of high trend and low trend, but they get any credit for hitting the target over the entire multi-year span, even though they missed the target in some years? Yeah, great question. Uh, folks from uh, folks from the OHA team, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the implementation committee dealed with this same question, and I'm almost certain I'd want to verify that um, there's no kind of credit given. The program is really based on a two-year performance period analysis, and then that's just repeated. And yeah, let me add in the original implementation committee did talk about this and they that's where the three out of five years came from. So we do look on a rolling basis. So it is possible that there's an alternating one year on one year off. Um, but that instead of you have to the, the three out of five years was sort of the, the reasonable compromise in that um, to, to address that. I will say that there were some concerns about a three out of five year approach because um, the implementation committee raised some questions about whether or not an organization could game this and say, we're going to front load all of our increases in one year and sort of take the hit in one year, but then make sure that we, you know, are managing things. And others on the committee said, well, you know, you'd have to really have a lot of control over the market. And we don't think it's likely that anybody would be able to manage the market, the, the, the macroeconomic factors to such a degree that they could game year on, year off three out of five, but I think they did talk about it. The last thing I'll say is, Mel, to your question, um, is the current advisory committee has had several discussions about whether or not cost growth should be averaged out over multiple years. And that is something that we are talking about to supplement our public reporting to continue to give that bigger picture, but that that doesn't change the, um, that we look at each two year performance period and the growth between those two years and that it's those uh, periods of time that add up for that three out of five years. So I think the short answer is no, we're not looking at an average calculation, but that is something we're exploring um, to supplement reporting to give a, a better understanding of what's happening over time. I see a hand from Greg, go ahead. Yeah, I've got several different thoughts on this. Uh, the first is kind of a general I'll start with kind of my general thoughts on what you presented, and then throw out an additional kind of suggestion. The first one is that it appears that the, the rules and regulations are being interpreted similar to an MLR type situation, where the concept there is you make too much money, it's not really reasonable for you to have that kind of profit, so you need to give that profit back. Okay, that has a very strong understanding here. This seems like you're applying the same thing. And I know your example showed that, you know, if you're going through the PMPM -PM difference, it almost treats like that difference over 3.4% is profit that should be recovered or something like that. And your example also showed that, yeah, it seemed pretty straight. You'd have 3% and 4% and 3% and kept it very, very thin. But I look at just this last year. And in commercial, you had 
10%, okay? Let's say that it was determined that that was not uh, reasonable, that that shouldn't have been 10%. Well, you'd have a $35 PMPM, you'd be sending Kaiser a bill for almost $200 million. Now, $200 million, you're gonna sit there and crash RBC ratios. You may not make it insolvent. You know, there's when you talk about solvency, that there's several levels of it. But if I looked at the RBC ratio and that suddenly took a crash of that amount, you have inherently made the industry and the protections that RBC type things for the citizens of Oregon, you've now weakened those protections for the sake of this program. So that's kind of a generalized thing that how big this could be and how devastating it could be and how I don't see that it's reasonable. So, you, and let's talk about the year that you had this 10%. Well, you've had a 10% hit, you didn't predict it. And maybe you could have said, well, it could have been controlled but if the company's already losing money, what well, you'd be telling Kaiser specifically, as an example, hey, there's $200 million that's going to go into some other program or some other place. And Sunnyside Hospital, by the way, which is for the benefit of Oregon citizens, we can't update it. We're going to have to just put off all capital improvements. We're going to not be able to invest in the very things that are needed to treat the, the public. So uh, to me, there's like this automatic, for the sake of, of the way this is being interpreted, automatically could actually harm the citizens of Oregon in terms of their healthcare. So I have a concern, that's just a general overlies thing. Uh, then I start thinking, well, okay, I do get what you're trying to do here. You know, So now I'm gonna put that as aside, which is the concern of Kaiser and say, Let's look at what, what you're doing here. You need to sit there and make it, you know, we'll say, suggested to the size of the company. So you have to, so tying it something to what the, cost, the, the company is makes perfect sense. It has to be scalable. Uh, it has to be scalable to the size of the, um, you know, how big you've gone over it. You know, the penalty should fit, the penalty should fit the crime, as they say. So. When I look at this, I look at another program that is done in Oregon for the OEB and PEP that is very similar to the same issue exactly. And when you look at the contracts for OEB and PEP, they go out there and they say things like, well, if you're above the 3.4%, there, there's going to be a penalty. This is actually part of the contractual things. And what they do is they say, we're going to take that and say, well, your costs were above that. We're going to look at what you had administratively in your costs. And they have kind of a couple tier system. They'll say, if it's greater than X percent, we're going to claw back some percentage of your administrative fees that that we and it would kind of be well you know what do you expect the, the margin to be so if there is a expected margin that would have been built within that administrative level you'd be saying you know what we're whether you achieve the margin we're not even going to care about because once again it's almost assumed if you had this big cost you probably didn't have a margin but this would sit there and say there's we'll say some sort of actual expectation of margin within a rating and administrative fees and what you say is, well, we're going to go in and we're going to say on that, we'll say actual expected value. And there's a lot of ways you could formulate this. You'd say, we're going to then hit you with some percentage of that. And so like I said, using no and PEP as an example, you might be able to come in and say, there's like a 2% hit against the administrative fee or 1%, whatever that would be. So you're making it a meaningful penalty to say, hey, you guys need to do something about this. But at the same time, you're not trashing your, your, the industry. You know, that you could have a year that, that you literally could really crash the industry uh, in the state of Oregon in one fell swoop. You know, um, so that's my concern. But you, like I said, um, I, in the flavor of saying, we understand that you want to have some teeth in this. You could create something that could make a meaningful, something that you feel it but it does not 
you know, the, the penalty fits the crime as opposed to just being this vast windfall. Now, so that's the program. The last thing I would sit there and say is I have concern over where does this money go? And using my example, us being an integrated company where we have hospitals, and when we, we're not for profit, we're going out there. We know that the, the money that we make in, in op gain goes towards replacing a hospital that is getting used. You know, just like, yeah, we know a house hospital wears out. And that's true. Of, and that's true even with the, the non hospital entities. There's a certain amount of the money that they're paying into the hospitals that they're having to pay that is exactly the same thing because. You don't want a situation where you no longer can have money that's available to do this. So I would sit there and make another recommendation that where is this money being kept? Because I would hate to sit there and say, hey, Oregon is a state. You're going to have substandard hospitals statewide, but we got lots of money to sit there and build some new roads. Um, I understand that roads are needed. <laughs> Greg, I, I, yeah. Greg, I want to jump in and I want to just clarify that last point because Zachary didn't cover it in his slides, but there is some statutory direction about where the dollars go. Um, and I think we'll want to talk about that more in rulemaking, but it's pretty clear that, that any dollars that are assessed through financial penalties do not go into a state general fund or a slush fund. They they don't go into offsetting roads. Um, and that, the, that there's specific intent that they go to support health programs, health um, uh, health equity investments type of thing. I think we wanna come back and have conversations about what makes sense there. Um, and I think there are some really interesting ideas that have been suggested in the last couple of days about sort of maybe they don't, maybe those dollars don't go to the state. Maybe they're a required investment that the entity has to make in those with those dollars instead. But I wanna just clarify for everybody that they, they don't just disappear into the ether. They are intended to be used for healthcare access um, and affordability and their statutory direction around that. Okay, thank you. That, that answers the questions and statements that I had from my point of view. Thanks, Greg, for sharing that. And, and it's a really interesting idea you propose. Uh, one thing that goes to my mind is uh, if we if it, if the penalty were to focus on kind of the admin slice uh, and it's some share of that, uh, what does that mean for the provider entities? Uh, I mean that, that's kind of a cleaner thing for the payer side, but for a provider, what, what does that look like? Um, which has uh, significantly less kind of regulatory oversight as to what admin is, what the MLR is. Um, so it's kind of a different can of worms. Um, yet we have to apply penalties to two different very different types of entities. The methodology could differ. There's nothing in statute that says the methodology has to be the same. So we could for sure entertain and, and explore that. Uh, but the question still uh, beckons what what would that be for, for providers? Uh, great and thoughts. I know we have some more comments and I, I see Travis, your hand is up as well, but I, I wanna just throw out one more thing that we didn't even put in the slides. Um, and maybe that was an oversight on our point part, but um, one option that is also an alternative is that the financial penalty is just a flat fee. It's just set and you know maybe it's like you exceed the target three times, $500,000 full stop. I think that you know thinking about those statutory criteria about whether or not that scales with the size of the entity or to the extent anyone exceeded the target, that doesn't really meet those. And this is something the implementation committee talked about earlier in the day uh, when they had these conversations, but that is, you know, technically an option and it's something that's very understandable, but I think the implementation committee felt that that would be very um, right offable as the cost of doing business in Oregon. So I think as we're thinking about this and as we're looking for all of your feedback, we want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear alternative solutions, but I think we're really trying to balance something that has that predictability, something that has that scalability, something that has teeth, and is not something that an organization can just say, this is gonna make me ignore the entire cost growth target program because the financial penalty, I, it's just the cost of doing business here and it doesn't matter. Great, let's go to Travis, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, when I look at those uh, fee, that fee schedule and what you're looking at there, and I agree with Greg on a number of those issues, um, but if you missed a target by you know the percentage times the member months times the dollars you're over means say you missed it by a million dollars then your penalty is now an additional million and one hundred thousand dollars the first time you've already 
been unprofitable by that million dollars of additional costs that you already bore, and then you're paying another $1.1 million on top of it at the first penalty. That seems like it's just an insane amount of, of a burden if you have something going on because it really deprives you of the ability to correct things from the and from the payer side. Um, yeah, if you have a bad contract that, that you're paying out too much on that drives up your costs, you may not be able to change that until the next year, but you have to bear the, the terms of your contract until that goes through. And you might be on the hook for a million dollars more than you really should have put out. But now you get penalized by the state by another million point one. And that's and I'm saying a million dollars because that's scalable by the size of your organization. It could be a lot more than that. And that's just on the first offense. The the degree of penalty that that you're that you're looking at right there, in addition to everything else, just seems like it's out of scale. And I want to remind folks that this the, the financial penalties, and I know this is the first time we're talking about them, but the financial penalties are intended to be the escalation. So by the time we get to this point, lots of things have happened. There have been a lot of conversations and justifications and documentation and back and forth about were these costs reasonable or not? Were these costs within the entity's control or not? The organization has likely already been on a performance improvement plan. Um, so I want to just recognize that this is sort of like the last resort, like lots of things have already happened. And so the reason that the implementation committee recommended this three out of five year period is so that we are allowing time. We know, and the committee knew and flagged things like it takes time to change these contracts. It takes time to, to write the ship or whatever metaphor you want to use. And so the financial penalties were never intended and they're not set up in statute to be the instant, you know, one year you're over, here's your, here's your bill. Um, this is, this is over a series of time and a lot of things happen between point A and point Z. So just want to just want to call that out. So I, I know that yes, these dollars could be large. And I think that that is valid. Um, and I, I think, you know, a million dollars could sound like a lot, $200 million could sound like a lot. And, you know, what is that in, when you actually compare it to total revenue or even to MLR? So in, in some cases, we're talking about a lot of money. And I think sometimes the dollars can sound really scary. But when you put those dollars in context of how much money is actually in the health system on the table, it might not be. It might just be, you know, pennies for some organizations. And I think that's again part of that balance of what's something that's scalable and meaningful. While that's true, um for different players in the market, they might have a much smaller percentage of margin. And so when you double the penalty, the cost that they already experienced on their own, because they had higher costs, and then you double it to which directly hits their their already smaller percentage margin that can be incredibly impactful and it can drive people out of the market totally and i think you know there was a comment i think from larry in the chat about talking to dcbs and i think we are very concerned about making sure that nothing here drives anybody out of the market or disincentivizes right. doing business in oregon so that's a concern i want to ask jerony can you go back to the slide that has the good reasons for exceeding cost growth target because i just it's a it's a few back, um, but I, I just want to put this up for everyone to remember that if there are costs that are going up that are outside of folks' control, which might include workforce, which might include new state laws and requirements, new federal requirements, taxes and penalties, other investments that the organization has made, none of that would contribute to one of those three out of five years before a financial penalty is assessed. It's slide 15, Durandi. Yeah, and that's great context, Sarah, to add that, you know, particularly lately, um, you know, today, macroeconomic factors are occurring. Um, today, there very well could be some continued effects of um, uh, um, acts of God, pandemics, COVID. So, you know, it, it's important to not only contextualize things, as Sarah's saying, in, in terms of what, what's the bigger picture, total revenues even total margin, but also in time, contextualize it in like, when is this happening? So yeah, these reasonableness factors are going to be critical and would preclude a financial penalty from occurring. There's another really good comment in the chat that I wanna flag for some discussion um, about 
that this approach might, appears to be a double penalty and that OHA sets PMPM rates for coordinated care organizations based on statewide rate of growth expectations. And I just want to clarify that the P, yes, we're, we use PMPMs in both um, CCO capitation rates and rate of growth, um, but that is totally separate from that. And you know, the equivalent here is that those CCO rates, that's that's the revenue side of things. And what we're measuring for the cost growth target program is the dollars that CCOs are paying out to providers. So I, I think, yes, there's a connection and that's something we're talking about with the CCO rates work group. And you know, one is prospective and one is retrospective, looking at dollars that actually went out the door. So I would be really cautious about you know, describing this as a double penalty because they're totally separate mechanisms looking at different sides of the accounting book. Um, and I think, that Sam and others might have more thoughts on that, but I, I want to just be really clear that this is different than the CCO rate setting process. Um, this is Aaron from HealthShare. <clears throat> that was my comment. Um, I, I guess the perspective is that if there is a high increase in uh, costs, right, the mechanism that has been developed by OHA is to increase rates to help uh, the CCOs cover those expenses. <clears throat> in this scenario, what would happen is since OHA limits uh, the ROG, um, those, those revenues don't increase. And then at the same time, um, if claims are increasing and we get hit with a penalty, you know, not only are our expenses going to go up because we get a penalty, but our revenues don't get up, go up. So from a holistic perspective, it is it is a double penalty, right? And I, our, our revenues are limited, and and we get then get a penalty. I want to clarify again. Yeah, Aaron, I, I hear what you're saying about you know it's sort of chipping away on both sides. I, I want to again clarify that there are all of these reasons that happen or that get taken into account before a penalty. So, you know, I think we're using a lot of language right now, like getting hit with a penalty. And I, I wanna, this is sort of last extenuating circumstances, like other avenues have been exhausted. And I think things that go into CCO rate setting, and again, Sam, I'm gonna tag you if you wanna add context here, but um, things that go into that conversation, those are some of the considerations that we would have as part of the determination of reasonable process. If OHA, raised or lowered CCO rates because of changes in services or benefits. That's something that's, you know, good reasons for impacting cost growth. So again, it's not an automatic, um, it's not an automatic consideration. And I'm, I'm starting to feel like I'm sounding a little defensive. So I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to shut up because this is really great feedback and concerns that you're raising. But I do just want to clarify for folks that I know this is the first time we're having this conversation and possibly some of these methods might sound really scary. And also, um, these are conversations that the implementation committee had really carefully thinking about what the right escalating mechanism would be and whether or not the escalating mechanism should be, should it be price setting? Should it be rate caps? Should it be financial penalties? And they landed on this. And I think we could send around again some of the, the discussion that the implementation committee had in 2020 when they landed on this and that led to setting this up in statute. So I think we want to make this as workable and as reasonable and your feedback is fantastic. So please keep it coming. And also, I think this is a, um, there were a lot of conversations that have come into this already um, and we're not necessarily sharing all that history. And I know not all of you were around for the 2020 conversations with the implementation committee. You know, I, I can really appreciate that, Sarah. I, I think the, the other concern is <clears throat> this is new and the people on this call are, you know, numbers oriented. We're either finance or actuarial types of folks, and we look at worst case scenarios. I know that you are trying to mitigate <clears throat> what you're saying by saying, well, we're going to look at these exceptions and these exceptions, you know, from a finance and actuarial perspective, we look at worst case, right? <clears throat> we look at worst cases, <clears throat> the rate of growth is 10%, and we're going to get hit with a penalty. We don't look at what we can say is the mitigating factors because we don't have that history on how that's implemented right totally fair thank you Aaron. That, that is i think that's a lot of the concern to be honest mm -hmm. yeah that's fair. i do want to respond to uh greg's note in the chat here that if a doctor knows they may get hit with, with big penalties could it encourage doctors to go to other states 
I want to clarify that um, there's no single doctor here that's going to be penalized, right? We have kind of size thresholds for what these provider entities are, um, and they're they're larger than a single doctor practice. You know, they they hung a shingle. So um, it's just just in terms of like an inclusionary criteria, that's important to keep in mind. Um, I see. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Bill, you got your hand up. Yeah. Thanks, Zachary. I, <laughs> I'm going to make a bold prediction since I have the ability to see the future. I will just say that you know, when I when I look at this, the thing that occurs to me is, based on what I'm seeing here, my prediction would be no penalty will ever be assessed. And the reason it seems to me that way is because the magnitude of these penalties will be so large in comparison to the providers or the, the the company's margins that you will not be able to in, to do it and there will always be some subject, subjective way to explain that there is a reasonable reason behind the increase um, it might be a better strategy to have a smaller penalty that you can actually impose as opposed to having a penalty that is so big that it, that it will not realistically be able to be imposed well, can I, I, I love that prediction. Can I ask you a philosophical question? Like, sure. Is it better to have a small penalty that organizations might say, yeah, it might happen, but it's not a big deal if it happens. So we're just going to write that off versus this big penalty, scary penalty that might never actually be assessed, but the sort of threat of it helps keep pressure on the system, which might actually be more effective in motivating change. That's a good philosophical question with, you know, with no is not answerable i guess my opinion would be that um a penalty that is significant without being gigantic i mean people will pay attention to that i know we would for sure we would you know you don't i don't think you need a penalty that's going to amount to like half of a company's entire margin in a in a particular year to get somebody to pay attention you know, when you look at like, you know, look at just for, as a health plan, I mean, maybe our MLR is around 90% or something like that. And so, you know, we're working with our gross margin before we even pay, you know, have any expenses of, you know, of 10%. And let's, you know, maybe our profit margin is one or 2%. Okay. Well, if you've got, if you missed the target for three years, say by an average of one or 2%, you could be talking about 6% of total revenue. I mean, oh my God. That's that is that's our profit for the for for a multi year period. That that could be half of our half of our entire operating margin for a, for a given year. I mean that's a huge penalty, and um, you know when you talk about a, a primary care group, it's a similar math because you know if say primary care is fifteen percent of total cost, I mean these penalties they could be huge. They're, you just wouldn't be able to implement them. And so, you know, it's, it's, so I, I get what you're saying philosophically, you know, it's like, um, I'm blanking on an analogy to use there, but I mean, the penalty would be so severe that yes, people would have to pay attention. Um, but maybe there's other ways of getting people to pay attention. Can I ask, and I asked this in the chat, I, I would love to hear, and we will not hold you to this, but like ballpark, what's significant is, you know, you're saying 6% is hugely problematic. I mean, Zachary threw out, you know, 0.1% of, of total earlier as an example. Like, is there a number that is sort of significant enough to pay attention to, but not, uh, let's say, financially devastating? I think significant is such a subjective term. I have no sense from you all, like, what you mean when you say significant or not significant. Yeah. Let me give that some thought. I don't mind throwing out a, a, a a suggestion for what I think would be significant. Thanks. And, you know, folks in the chat, if you have numbers, again, welcome it, will not hold you to it. And I want to make sure we're hearing a lot from the plan folks. I know we have some providers on the call too. So provider organizations would love your thoughts, especially because you don't have the MLR parallel. Greg, I see your hands and, you know, Kaiser is also a provider, so let's go ahead.
it may be a, an older hand from previous. And that's okay. I guess I, I need to take myself off mute. Uh, there you go. I have another kind of concept just to toss, and I don't know how you would work this in. And I just think about how things get played out in terms of premiums that go out to the member groups. So a lot of times you might have a trend and, and I think HSO was talking kind of along those concepts because the state will come in and say, well, we don't care what your, your, your trends were. We're going to just give you 3.4%. You're done. You know, you get the same thing with OEB and PEB where they just come in and say, you know, that's, that's your issue. You're going to have to, you, you're going to have to make it up next year and figure out a way to sit there and control your costs. So how do you work into this process? The idea that a group may, uh, a, an entity may go above the 3.4%, but they make the choice not to pass it on to the consumer, which is what this is all about. Because ultimately it's what, what premium is being charged to the consumer, which is determining the, you know, what the costs are. And we, look, we focus on cost as the underside. Is there a way you can sit there and say, well, if you're above the 3.4%, but you don't, pass that on to the consumers, you're, you're choosing, you're eating it, and you're, you're internally telling yourself, I'm gonna do something about this. Can that become part of the calculation uh, as opposed to a penalty because you've self-imposed a penalty by keeping your rates below the 3.4%. An interesting idea. Thanks for bringing that. We do have um, in the I'm, I'm thinking of the pimp, the pip pip template. Um, there is, I think, at least in the way I've been thinking about it, um, some space to talk about. You know, okay, the entity is going to have to embark on some strategy, right, to uh, to to lower the growth, um, and and what does that look like? And if there are savings from now to later, how are those savings? realized and where do they go do they get converted to you know lower cost sharing amounts for some you know somehow or, or lower premium growth you know that kind of thing so well i think what you're saying greg could tie into the the pit process i think what you're proposing is to tie it into the penalty calculation itself and, and think of it uh think of it in a slightly different way i'm also interested greg's comments making me think about you know again thinking about this is all about affordability for the consumers and this may be a mechanism that only works for calculating for payers not providers but what if the penalty is funneled back into holding premiums down and so it doesn't go into a state fund somewhere but it is essentially a premium rebate like there are for ACA plans um are there are there options there maybe Oh, you're all quiet. That's a problem. I want to flag again, are there other thoughts from the provider perspective, provider orgs that are on the call? We've been talking a lot about premiums and margins, and I know it's all a really different set of calculations from your perspective. I also want to just state a, a fact that uh, you, uh, you all are familiar with, but I just want to put it out there that the, the plans are already used to thinking of things in terms of MLR and thinking in terms of, you know, uh, rate review processes that DCBS does. But the providers don't have anything even closely analogous with that necessarily. So, um, so you know, this penalty construct kind of fits sort of, it's very different. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's somewhat related to MLR, premium rate review, you know, in, in terms of just kind of oversight. But for the providers, this is like totally new. So I'm, I'm in, really interested in, um, in hearing from, from provider groups and, and entities. I 
I think we might also be hitting information overload. So maybe this is our time for our regularly scheduled. Feel free to send us your yeah. thought over email. We really welcome additional yeah. ideas, reactions to all of this. Um, and again, we're going to continue developing this. We plan to come back in June. We also will be bringing some of these thoughts based on your input and revisions um, to the advisory committee in July. Yeah, so if you, if uh, and new ideas, totally different ideas are welcome as well, right? If you have, uh, and we've heard some today, which is excellent. Um, but if you have a totally new or just a slightly, you know, a variant on the theme, we welcome all of that. You know, we have to figure out these penalties, it's in statute. Uh, so it's a matter of how we operationalize, how we implement, how we calculate. Great. Well, I think with that, um, Joanne, do you give me a favor and, and switch to slide way down now, way down. Bear with me. 45. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I think I'll pass it back to Trang if Trang's still on. Uh, we've got a wrap up meeting in, uh, in June, the end of June from 10 to noon. Uh, yeah. We're going to continue discussions here on accountability. Yeah, Trang, go ahead, take it away. Yeah, well, I mean, that's basically it. We're going to continue talking about this topic next month. Um, and yeah, thanks for the great feedback today. Uh, send us an email if you have other thoughts, and we'll bring uh, more to this conversation next month. We, thanks, we do. Wait, hold on. Before we, we have a couple oh. more slides, though. Um, go to the next slide, just in terms of like high level timeline. Um, mm -hmm. So we have some data submission stuff uh, happening. Um, let's see, May, we're going to release. 2023 editions of the template. Um, anything else to highlight here, Trang? Um, no, this is a running schedule we have. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see the rest of the year. These are our tentative tag plans. Um, and another reminder, uh, the files this year are due uh, the 1st of September. All right. All right. We can probably wrap it there, right? Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Really appreciate the uh, participation, collaboration, and input. These slides are it. available online. Yep. And so yeah. it's supposed to link. All right. Have a good rest of your Wednesday, everybody. Thanks, all. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.